Hey there, YouTube. Unless you've been living under a rock for the last month, you've probably seen some news about the revolution going on in Ukraine and the recent Russian invasion. This is all on top of the shoddy conditions at the Sochi during the Olympics and a long slew of anti-gay laws coming out of Russia over the last few years. The international community is in a tizzy over it, however, it doesn't look like anything is going to be done. The Obama administration, along with many other Western nations, have condemned Russia's actions in the Crimea. Why is Russia doing this? Is it because there is now a less friendly Russian government in Ukraine? Is it because Russia just hates gays? Or is there something going on that most people are unaware? Of. What will the West do? Why has President Obama been much harsher on Russia and Putin in the last year than in the rest of his presidency? Let's connect the dots. Like all nations, the Russian Federation is concerned about its security. And given its history, it has a fairly good reason to be. Long before Russia became what we know of it today, it was a vast land ruled by rival city-states. Russia's first major enemy would not come from the West, but from the East. This enemy has proven to be the one power that is immune to most of the laws of history. I'm speaking, of course, of the Mongols. The Mongols conquered more territory than any other power in history, much of it being in modern-day Russia. The Mongols extorted tribute out of the Russian city-states, with the most generous tribute giver being given the title of Grand Prince. Eventually, one Grand Prince, Ivan the Great, managed to unify the Russian peoples and drive the assortment of Eastern invaders out of Russia and form the modern Russian state. Since then, the Russia has been invaded a number of times. The French attempted under Napoleon in 1812, the Germans tried twice, once under Kaiser Wilhelm II during World War I, and then again under Adolf Hitler in World War II. Most of the invasions were over a century ago, but at least one of these invasions has been within the lifetime of some living Russians. The history of a nation often becomes part of a collective consciousness for a peoples. With these events in mind, it is understandable that Russia would be concerned. But why is Russia afraid of its security now? No one has invaded Russia since they acquired nuclear weapons, and Russia has shown a willingness to use its military to secure its national interests. So what is Russia worried about in terms of its security? Russia likes having buffer zones, and during the Cold War they had the Eastern Bloc countries of the Warsaw Pact to serve as these buffers. However, the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 quickly arose to that buffer zone, it spent the better part of a century holding on to. Not only did it lose Warsaw Pact nations such as East Germany, Poland, and Romania, it also lost pieces that had been historically controlled by Russia, such as Georgia, the Baltics, and Ukraine. Needless to say, this left Russia feeling very exposed, but it gets worse from there. As soon as the Iron Curtain fell, the United States and the West swooped in and started gobbling up these countries, adding them to different international organizations like NATO and the EU. This encroachment puts Russia on edge because it always wants to put as much distance as it can between the West and Moscow. Russia also feels threatened in the east as well. Russia's Far East has been underpopulated since its acquisition, and they fear Chinese taking the region. The threat in the east is the essential problem plaguing all of Russia today. Russia is in a demographic crisis. In particular, Russians are not having enough babies. After World War II, birth rates rose around the world. This led some academics to dust off the old ideas of Thomas Malthus, the idea that the world's population is going to grow so fast that the world will not be able to sustain such a population level. Now, despite the fact that these claims are not true, which we will discuss at another time, by the time these ideas ideas started getting publicized again in the 1960s, the population growth rate started to go down worldwide. In 1960, Russia had a birth rate of 2.6 children per woman. In 2013, that rate was 1.34. At least that is amongst ethnic Russians. This population decline is also caused by a high mortality rate. Life expectancy in Russia is often about 10 to 15 years less than in their western counterparts. This is often due to rampant alcoholism, drug use, and violence. Russia also has the world's highest abortion rate at 73 abortions for every 100 live births. These statistics Statistics, however, are mostly for ethnic Russians. I assume you're now asking, why is high death rate and low birth rates for ethnic Russians any different for any other populations in Russia? That's a good point, and a high birth rate of non-ethnic Russians would not certainly be a bad thing if they were culturally assimilated into the country. The problem, however, is that they are not. They are not culturally assimilated. Like much of Europe, Russia does not encourage minorities to assimilate. This has created within Russia a mindset of us versus them, and this threatens to tear the country apart. The increasing non-Slavic populations of Russia is putting the Kremlin into panic mode. In the West, we have Russian Muslims populating the Volga and the Caucasus. Russia has had trouble with Muslim regions since its beginning, and in the 1990s, Russia fought a number of wars in Chechnya and Dagestan, two of the Muslim regions in the Caucasus. In 2004, Islamic terrorist separatists from Chechnya held 1,100 people, most of whom were children, hostage in a school in Beslan, Russia. For three days, they held them captive. The crisis ended when Russian forces stormed the school, and a firefight lasting several hours broke out. By the end of it, 380 people were dead. Just imagine Sandy Hook and September 11th rolled into one, and you will get a glimpse of what this event was to the Russian citizens and its government. With events like this in its recent history, it is easy to see why the Russian government, under Putin or otherwise, would be apprehensive about increasing the numbers of non-Slavic peoples in Russia. There are also growing population troubles in the East. During the Tsarist and Soviet periods of Russian history, being sent to Siberia was usual punishment for many crimes. This did two things for the Russian state. It sent criminals far away, and it helped populate an underpopulated area. Under Stalin, many ethnic minorities were forcibly relocated from areas in the Western Soviet 
Soviet Union, such as Ukraine, and relocated to Central Asia and the East. This served to defuse a population from its land and populate another. Since the fall of the Soviet Union, however, many of these ethnic groups have been returning west to their homelands, leaving parts of Central and Eastern Asia depopulated. With high abortion rates, the treatment of girls, and the one-child policy, China has been left with a large number of men with no one to marry. Many of these men have been moving into Central and Eastern Russia, where land is cheap and plentiful. Many of them work for Chinese mining and logging companies operating in Russia. The Kremlin fears these people because they are loyal to China and not to Russia. So here we have the root of Russia's problem. Too much land to defend with too few people to defend it. So Russia has decided to take action to medicate these problems. After the collapse of the Soviet Union and the terrible situation in the 1990s, Putin's government has been doing all it can to encourage ethnic Russians living outside of Russia to return to the motherland. This worked for about a decade, but now it seems that they have run out of Slavs willing to come back. Just recently, after the invasion of Crimea, the Kremlin offered Russian citizenship to any ethnic Russian or Russian-speaking person in former Soviet bloc countries' citizenship and monetary rewards for immigrating to Russia. They have passed financial incentives to encourage Russian women to have more children, along with passing laws banning the adoption of Russian children to certain foreigners. They also banned abortion advertising and are considering banning abortions altogether. And this leads me to the anti-gay laws passed in Russia. A number of these laws have been passed, but the most recent one bans the advertising of the LGBTQ lifestyle style to minors. Where do these laws come from, you ask? These laws, I believe, are just a small part of the Kremlin's attempt at stemming the demographic crisis they have. And now we get to the Ukraine. We start with the Orange Revolution. In 2004, there were allegations of fraud, voter intimidation, and corruption in the Ukrainian presidential election. Large numbers of demonstrators hit the streets of Kiev using civil disobedience. The protests led to Ukraine's Supreme Court calling for a redo of the election with demands of international observers monitoring the election. After much scrutiny, the international observers declared this redo to be free and fair. This led to the pro-Western Viktor Yukashenko defeating the pro-Russian Viktor Yanukovych. By 2010, however, the people of Ukraine had grown tired of the Orange Revolution government. The officials had become corrupt and an election was held. This election returned the pro-Russian Viktor Yanukovych to power. During his second presidency, he began to take Ukraine away from its path of becoming a member of the EU and back towards a closer relationship with Russia. And then again in February of 2014, the people of Ukraine took to the streets of Kiev to protest the actions of Yanukovych and demanding his resignation. Unlike the last time this had happened to him, Yanukovych was not going to let protesters force him out of office again. He called and security forces to put down the protesters. This set off a chain reaction that had led to most of Kiev on fire. Eventually, Yanukovych fled Kiev as protesters stormed the presidential palace and a new government was installed. This led to Russian forces occupying the Crimean Peninsula. The Russians justified it the same way that they justified intervening in Georgia in 2008. They claimed to be protecting ethnic Russians in the Crimea. It also just so happens that Russia has a naval base in the Crimea. We see here another instance of Russia looking to protect its demographic and economic interests. Russia is not a big big superpower looking to flex its muscles like much of the media would suggest. It is rather a desperate homeless man hoping the person he's mugging doesn't realize the gun he's holding is empty. So now we get to President Barack Obama. He has not been the toughest president on Putin or on Russia. During the 2008 election, he was criticized over his waffling on Russia's invasion of Georgia. I am extremely concerned about what's happening there. Uh, I uh, wholeheartedly condemn the violation of Georgia's sovereignty. During the 2012 election, he was accidentally caught on mic, telling Prime Minister Medvedev that after his re-election, he would be more flexible. That's my choice, please. Yeah. After my election, I have more flexibility. And he later ridiculed Mitt Romney for his foreign policy regarding Russia. When you were asked what's the biggest geopolitical threat facing America, you said Russia. Not Al-Qaeda. You said Russia. In the 1980s or now, calling to ask for their foreign policy back because, you know, the Cold War has been over for 20 years. However, it was in 2013 that President Obama was finally forced to confront his Russian issues. During the Syrian WMD crisis, he was beating the war drum, amping up pressure on the Assad regime to hand over his stockpile of chemical weapons. However, in the end, it was Putin who negotiated a deal with Assad to destroy the chemical weapons. The Obama administration tried to take credit for the deal, claiming that his spear rattling pushed Putin and Assad into a deal out of fear. I think it's fair to say that uh, we would not be at this point without a credible threat of a military strike. But most did not buy it. This event embarrassed Obama and his administration to such a degree that he was willing to openly and publicly have a foreign adversary. With persecutions of homosexuals in Russia, it was the perfect storm for President Obama to take a hard line on an international stage. So now we can see how the dots fit together. Russia's demographic crisis is the roots of its actions against the Ukraine, Muslims, and gays, which gives President Obama the cover he needs to take a strong foreign policy stance. Thanks for connecting the dots with me, and I'll see you next time.